Hi, everyone. This is Disruption Talks. And uh, I actually don't have a driver's license. I know it's a weird way to start the episode, but I don't have a driver's license. I was convinced all my life that I'm actually going to get a driver. But the way things are looking, autonomous driving will come much faster than I will have a driver. So the trend that I'm trying to present here is that more and more the things that we used to own and that were costs to us as individuals, they're being outsourced. And that's a trend across cars. That's a trend across places. You can find 1,400 islands or NBNB to rent. So that trend is here to stay. Um, today, we will be having a special guest from one of those economy uh, sharing economy uh, companies from the Middle East. It's Kareem. And joining us today, we have Fardad, who is uh, going to discuss with us all the things about super apps. Hi, Fardad. Hi, Philippe. Glad, uh, glad to be here. I'm, I'm just as glad as you are. So uh, let's dive right in. Uh, short personal story introduction. What is a day of uh, what does a day in the life of a head of platform strategy and Kareem incubator look like? Cool. Uh, so as the, as the head of a strategy, I'm pretty much responsible for the strategy and vision of, of the company at the group level. That means that there are certain activities that uh, I'm going to be engaging on a kind of uh, ongoing basis. I mean, we look at the, the vision and horizon of the company over the next five to seven years. And of course, on the basis of that, we drive uh, a kind of two-year strategy followed by a one-year strategy. And then we do kind of uh, refresh that strategy every quarter based on the outcome of that strategy. So this is, in principle, uh, my team's responsibility. Apart from the ongoing activities, there are also a number of uh, different high-priority strategic topics that case by case we pick up and then we deliver them to the respective owner of that, uh, that piece. So different verticals and different line of business within Kareem, they all would have like different strategic topic, whether it's about market sizing, whether it's about articulating their kind of competitive uh, uh, response, whether it's going to be around entering a new market, whether it's about developing a new product, we're picking up the, the, this topic and then we, uh, we articulate the strategy or, or recommendation accordingly and then deliver it back uh, to the business. On average, I could say maybe three or four kind of topics is what we're going to engage in, let's say, on an ongoing basis at any point in time. And okay. of course, in terms of my uh, daily routine, uh, pretty much my, my calendar is occupied by uh, around 60-70% of the time with meetings, and meetings about business review, meetings that discussing kind of the same strategic topic, uh, with, uh, with things that are becoming remote first. In Akshareem, of course, most of uh, my time is spent behind Zoom attending this meeting, but I'm also uh, problem solving with my own team if not on a daily basis, every another day, we definitely have a couple of hours of problems. OK, so let's focus on the strategy part, because I know that the pandemic obviously has been an accelerant and it has left all companies with ride hailing probably at a, at a decrease. I know that there have been figures of up to 80 percent. Not sure if that's been Kareem specifically. I know that ride hailing companies simply suffered like that. And uh, I have this quote uh, here that COVID-19 has really been a booster. That comes from your CEO and co-founder. Our customers were locked down, so they started asking, you have drivers, can you deliver my food? I imagine that that was a, a huge strategic decision for you guys. Uh, perfectly true. I mean, uh, COVID hit, uh, hit uh, the region globally. I mean, every one of us lives uh, was impacted by the pandemic. Uh, the impact of the pandemic on the right hailing and sharing economy in general was uh, pretty intense. Uh, so we were lucky that we already had expanded our service portfolio to food delivery already in 2018. So we were somehow ready to shift our focus uh, from the pure right hailing, the core right hailing to, uh, to other service uh, delivery, uh, including food delivery. Uh, hence, uh, we actually managed to engage most of our captains in food delivery, and pretty soon we actually started to launch our shops and order anything uh, services. So in that respect, we actually managed to compensate for the loss 
on on the on, on raw railing by other kind of uh, delivery and logistics services. So from that perspective, uh, we were lucky. I think we're gonna get to the topic of super app, but we had the intention uh, to become a super app. We can claim that we are the first super app of the region uh, beyond Iran and Turkey. I would say. Uh, so from that perspective, we were pretty much ready to start accelerating our service portfolio expansion and start adding more service in our super app. So that helped us a lot during the pandemic. Okay, and this is a this is a personal curiosity because obviously I had a look at your LinkedIn and your career shows a lot of experience that does with consulting, but also a lot of with data analysis and academia. So I imagine that the scientific approach is uh, no stranger to you. How, I'm sure a lot, but still answer how much applicable is all of that as a transferable skills to the things that you do right now. I imagine that you rely on data strongly, if not just on data, right? Correct. Uh, I mean, the, the old fashioned, old school kind of a strategic thinking was primarily around a couple of popular frameworks and some sort of a kind of gut feeling, right? I mean, leadership based on their own kind of instinct, they were coming up with, uh, let's say, ideas and then they were testing it out. And then they had like uh, a strategic uh, maneuver around uh, those decisions. I think the, uh, the new trend in a strategic thinking is all about data. Like it's all about data-driven decision making. So from that perspective, a lot of my time and my team's time is actually spent on synthesizing data, whether it's customer data, whether it's captain data, whether it's kind of market data, industry trend, whether it's kind of cream uh, operational data. So from that perspective, my kind of data analysis experience uh, helped me a lot. Um, from a kind of, kind of consulting perspective. Of course, uh, as a kind of uh, head of a strategy, I need to start picking up different problems or opportunities. I need to start breaking them down into a smaller pieces. I need to start cracking them one by one, putting them all together, and then building a recommendation, and then rightly communicating back to the senior leadership of Kareem. Um, I wouldn't say without my consulting background, I was or I was not able to deliver that quality, but I can say that my kind of consulting experience helped me a lot in, in managing this sort of kind of problem uh, kind of problem statement breakdown problem solving and then communication uh, to getting leadership all right so we've heard about you and before we dive into the topic of the super apps i think we should frame it in terms of kareem uh i of course could mention that it's been acquired by uber i could mention that it does uh, delivery of food, I can mention that it does ride hailing, but I think it's best if you do an introduction that shows us the overview of Kareem, uh, what it was, what it is. Sure. Uh, so Kareem uh, uh, got uh, incepted in 2012, actually in Ramadan of, of that year, uh, by the two co-founders, Mudassar and Magnus, uh, the alumni. Uh, and in the beginning, it uh, it happened to be a kind of corporate car dispatch. So meaning that it would deliver a kind of car. It, it was a kind of more B2B business providing car services and driver services to, to co company. Right? At okay. that point in time, I was working for McKinsey. And I can recall that I was getting, I mean, we were all happy that we had uh, something called Kareem in the region. So instead of huggling in the street and then getting a, a ride, on the street from one client to another one, we had uh, the opportunity to use an app and then book a car. Uh, from that point over the period of two to three years, it transformed itself to a ride hailing. The way we understand at Uber, at the first uh, ride hailing company of the world in a kind of marketplace model. Uh, then over time, it decided to expand its service portfolio. The first non-ride hailing service that was added on app publicly was food delivery in 2018. And that was the moment that the company decided to go beyond ride hailing uh, because it, it realized that there are a lot of synergies across the board. And then there is also a way to increase the earning opportunity for a captain that we do care a lot uh, about. So, uh, and then in 2019, as I already mentioned, we had the idea of becoming a super app. The first instance of our public super app got launched in 2020. Uh, 
uh, right in the middle of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and then from that point on, we just like getting into that kind of uh, uh, super abrace. I can again claim that we are the first one in the region beyond Iran and Turkey to actually become a super app. And uh, I can also announce that this week, we're gonna have our first third party service provider on our super app. So we're gonna launch our first external tenant on our super app. And then inshallah, pretty soon, we're gonna have hundreds of them on our, on our platform. Okay, uh, I gotta ask, you can say no, NDA or whatever, but can you share anything? If not the name, at least the industry or the- It's, uh, I, can, I can share, I'll, I'll wait for the name for the big announcement to happen over the next few days, but uh, it's uh, one of the key players in home services and repair industry. Uh, we have started to do a lot of extensive market research, trying to understand what are the high frequency use cases that caters to the needs of people in this region. At the end of the day, Karim is about simplification of people's life in this region. And then apart from ride hailing, food delivery, we realized that home services is one of the most frequent use cases. Hence, we decided to have our first tenant in that category. That's 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 super interesting. I actually back in my university years, I was very interested in companies like TaskRabbit, for example. So companies that also essentially you outsource your chores, your day to day, uh, sort of the the maintenance of the human life that we have that gets in the you're way. Gonna have, uh, you're going to have one of them uh, very soon uh, on, our, on your cherry map. Fantastic. Fantastic. But let's also dive into this topic, Uber acquiring Kareem. It was big news for sure, for you, for the world, and for Uber itself. And if you can share, what was the impact on the companies involved? I know that it's always a, a specific transition. We're looking at companies from two different regions, two different cultures. Um, the local startup ecosystem, I'm sure that there were first, second order effects. Can you speak on that? A flip, I would say in the first place, it was a big thing for the region, right? I mean, it. Uh, it gave a lot of hope and excitement to the tech community uh, in the region, right? It, uh, it uh, created a viable exit option for all the entrepreneurs and tech startup in the region. They started to believe that this region can also have a unicorn. I think from that perspective, the impact was magnificent across the region. Um, from my own experience, uh, let's let's be honest on that. I mean, we used to have Uber as our biggest competitors, right? Me as the head of a strategy, I used to uh, track Uber, what they offer, their kind of tactique, their operation, if not on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. We had this like think tanks on, let's say, problem solving station on a weekly basis, looking at Uber, how they actually getting into the pricing, how do they actually trying to uh, change the customer experience and so on and so forth. So as, as Uber being our biggest competitor, uh, it was super exciting. And I would say even a bit surprising for me and together with a lot of our Kareem colleagues that I know and have talked about uh, this. Uh, I mean, getting to know people on the other side of the story, people whom you consider as your biggest threat, let's, let's put it that way, right? I mean, maybe we're like fighting days and nights to beat Uber in every market and every category we operated in, right? And then suddenly over overnight, they became friends, right? And then it was amazing how well we managed to establish relationship with our counterparts in Uber. And now openly, we can actually start discussing things and, and talking with each other and working with each other. Uh, so from that perspective, I think I'm super glad that I was part of that journey in that point in time. And I'm very proud of my, let's say, super smart colleagues and friends at Uber. And I learned a lot from them. So from that perspective, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, very exciting. Uh, with respect to uh, the impact, uh, I would say, if I say pretty much not anything major, you may you may you may get surprised too, right? Uh, I would say the two companies are independent. There are two independent brands. We actually competing head to head in every market in which we operate. Okay, so this is this is part of the deal. 
We, uh, Chariim, remain an independent brand competing with Uber. Of course, there are areas that make sense for customers and captains for us to actually collaborate. I can name, name you a few if, if you're interested in. I mean, for example, uh, there have been a kind of public-private partnership program in Saudi to provide a kind of uh, support to low-income female commute to the work. Uber was part of that uh, program in the beginning, and then Karim joined the effort with Uber uh, afterwards. There is also a lot of collaboration and data sharing happening between the two companies when it comes to, uh, uh, let's say, security and risk screening for our customers and captain to make sure that they all get into a safe ride and they have a pleasant journey. So there are synergistic area where the two companies collaborate with each other, similar to any other two players in the in this industry. But in principle, I would say the impact on Kareem and how we internally operate and organize have been have been minimal. Okay, I mean, I'm really glad to hear about the the synergy, but also on the the macro level, the one that you mentioned, generally just inspiring confidence in the region that yes, you can have a unicorn. I mean. Us in Poland, we are also waiting for uh, similar confidence because the Central Eastern Europe has had some some of those winners. I mean, there's been uh, there's been WhatsApps, been Brainly. However, we still look forward to to more of those arising here as well. So I feel you there. And in terms of super apps, and, and you... Philip, uh, just to add to that, I think uh, Karim, uh, all of us have been pretty lucky to have Uber as one of the biggest tech companies of the world being interested in this region. And I can confess that uh, Kareem is actually one of the biggest bets of Uber in this region. They are super supportive of, of our vision. And I think it's, it's great to have, let's say, a strong, uh, resourceful uh, parent backing you up. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can see that. So we spoke about you. We spoke about the company. Now it's time to speak about the industry, but with the super app focus. So dear audience, I'm sure that all of you have a folder with the iPhone apps that you use the most. I have. I actually called them by the seven deadly sins. So vanity is my social media. Gluttony is, for example, moving around. And super apps is the next step from actually having your manual folders. Right, Fardad? Can you can you tell us what are super apps in general? What's their purpose? Sure. I think uh, in principle, uh, uh, a super app is pretty simple. It's, it's one single app offering multiple service offerings, right? Typically, we used to think about an app that is being developed for a particular purpose, offering a particular kind of service. If you start bundling different services in a meaningful way, having some common elements among them being shared, including, let's say, the profile of the customer, uh, payment options, uh, loyalty program, and so on and so forth, into one single app, that is, in principle, called a super app. Super app, in a sense, is a kind of all-in-one app, is a kind of one-stop shop, to so speak. OK. Um, so we heard what are they, and I want to ask, in what environment do they uh, thrive uh, best? Uh, the birthplace of super app, at least the way we know super app as of now, is, is China, right? I mean, the mother of all super app is WeChat. Uh, that goes without saying. We're talking about an app easily over uh, over one billion monthly active users. It's, it's, it's massive. Uh, uh, we started in 2011, of course, uh, not in one, uh, let's, let's say, not overnight having all the services in one single place. It, it, it went through a journey, it started to add uh, payment services over time, it started to add the, the WeChat mini program on top of the platform. But in principle, Southeast Asia, I would say, is the birthplace of, uh, of Super App. And then again, we can look at what the key reasons behind it. I think afterwards, uh, the, the whole super app trend has started to move towards the West. And then India was probably the second uh, geography where we can see and, and trace uh, super app like Paytm, like Geo. Uh, then I would say Middle East and Latin America. The Latin and Middle East are probably the third generation of super apps. 
So we see the proliferation of superab in this region, Karim being the first, and there are a couple of other kind of uh, contenders in the region. And you, you look at Latin America, maybe Rappi is the biggest super app, and then Didi is already there. Uh, and then if, when we look at the Western world being Western Europe, or let's say uh, Northern America, we still haven't really seen a kind of major super app player, but I can already see the trends happening there. In terms of what makes a region ready for super app, I think being mobile first is, is definitely a helpful characteristic of the region. I mean, there are regions in which people have started to have an analog phone and then move to a mobile phone, and then over time they started to move to a smartphone. There are regions, there are countries, and there are groups of segments of the market we, who actually shifted from no phone right away to a smartphone. Right? These people get to, let's say they're used to their smartphone for whatever they do. Right? I mean, from that perspective, the concept of super app is much more appealing and acceptable for those people. Um, another characteristic of the market is actually looking at whether the region is a kind of product centric or is it like ecosystem centric, right? The Western mentality is mainly looking at a product at a combination of different features which delivers a service or a purpose at the best kind of quality, okay? Uh, as you go to the East, and I'm talking about Southeast Asia in principle, they're actually thinking in more holistic ecosystem play rather than a product play. For them, it's, it's all about the interplay between different products with an in ecosystem that build an ecosystem rather than one single product. And the last but not least is also about the maturity of industry, right? There are certain industries, there are certain markets where customers already have access to top-notch, standalone, the so-called category killers. You're thinking about food delivery that is already, let's say, three, four, five kind of top-notch standalone apps out there. You're thinking about home services, you're thinking about grocery, you name it, right? Um, Middle East is not necessarily one of those regions. I'm not saying that the quality of service is horrible, but I can claim that it's not the case that the quality of service across all the categories is perfect. So there is a still room for improvement and there is a lower, let's say, uh, barrier cost. There is a lower switching cost for a customer to switch from one of those existing app to a super app. So all these things, uh, let's say hand in hand, help the, uh, the growth of, of super app in this region. It's, it's very interesting to think about the, the app as, as a concept, because I remember having the first iPod Touch. I remember when they released iOS 2.0 with the App Store, you could get the apps. You would download all of the apps that you could. You would just fill up all the home screen. Uh, and then over time, uh, and the statistics prove what I'm saying, like the home screen, anything after like the first screen, anything that you swipe is basically an app graveyard. It's a place where apps either haven't been launched at all or have been launched once. Uh, sometimes these apps are authenticators, so that's what they're supposed to do. But come to think of it, I think that only banking, banking is a category where you sort of have to have the app to operate in terms of banking and it makes sense and you actually use it a lot. But outside of that category, and for example, those services that we're discussing here, it's very difficult to find uh, a necessity for you to have an app or not just do it online uh, from your sort of Safari, Google Chrome, or whatever is your web browser poison. But coming back to uh, to the super apps, uh, we've spoken about the fact that it has accelerated Kareem, uh, but have you seen maybe any acceleration of your players competing or or not necessarily competing in the region? Have you seen the, the positive impact of Kareem on the whole ecosystem? I would say yes. I mean, uh, I think in 2019, where we were discussing and talking in press and public about Super App, it was probably still in a, in a kind of infancy, like in a kind of earlier stage in the region. Uh, of course, the, the pandemic, the COVID accelerated digital adoption across the region. I mean, many people have started to get used to online purchases. Many things that people used to uh, uh, to get offline have started to, to become online. Uh, so these things together, so let's say the, uh, the attempt of Kareem uh, to uh, unleash and, and reveal its super app, plus the pandemic and then COVID situation, 
accelerated the, uh, let's say, the proliferation of, of super app uh, among many other players in the region. Uh, we definitely have more players right now in, the, in this race. We call it a super app race. Uh, to be honest, uh, I'm personally, and I'm aware of, of uh, almost all of my uh, Kareem colleague and the company as a whole, we're pretty much actually excited. I mean, a race without competition is a bit boring, right? So, I mean, having competitors, especially a strong competitor, it keep you, uh, keep you get better and better, right? It, it pushes you to raise the bar and start asking yourself every day, what you can do better. And I think from that perspective, early days we used to have Uber as our key competitors. Now we have a lot of more competitors in the super app race, but I'm pretty much excited about it. Okay, so the thing that I want to ask over here also concerning super apps is, so we've spoken about the young Philip iPod Touch installing all the apps from App Store. Now we're talking about adult Philip loading one super app uh what is the next step of that evolution where are we going to end up like is google and apple going to allow uh, some super app partnerships to go onto the platform i know that some devices come preloaded with for example wechat as you've mentioned but uh, i'm pretty sure that it, when it comes to for example apple and their uh, market share of the smartphone uh it's going to be tough to convince them to preload anything onto their os what's your take on that uh, pretty good question. Let me uh, let me share with you a pretty profound prediction. This is my personal prediction. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it doesn't have to do uh, with Kareem, but personally, I predict that a large portion of the market demand is going to be consolidated, at least in this region, over the next couple of years. Again, what's the exact number? I don't know, but I can say probably 70, 80 percent of the demand is going to be consolidated among a number of uh, big platforms. And, and, and of course, Kareem, uh, uh, I'm supposed to be one of those big platforms. I think the next wave for me, which is pretty much exciting, is for all the third party, smaller businesses, right? You can think about a small business being completely offline, or you, tend, you can think about in a small business being online with some presence offline. You can think about a mom and pop shop kind of a store. You can think about all those social commerce uh, kind of shops. I would say they realize that it's in their benefit, and this is super beneficial for them to start getting into partnership with one or some of these platforms. Right? As a kind of a small business, as a third party service provider, in order to come online, and again, becoming online is not anymore a choice, is a must, right? COVID proved it to us that, hey, there is no other way you can survive without being online. No matter what you do, no matter what you offer, you need to have an online presence, right? So I would expect with all these platforms started to collecting a lot of demand and then providing best in class services to the tenants, very soon the small businesses realize that the best way for them to survive and to grow is to actually start partnering with this platform. And then a small business, instead of focusing on building an app and then creating awareness around your app with marketing and then creating demand, acquiring users, retaining users, and then building a kind of top-notch, sophisticated uh, customer care infrastructure, integrating payment option, you rather focus on what you're good at. You rather focus on your core business and leave everything else to this big platform. Hey, Karim, you already have a huge demand. We're talking about almost 50 million active users, right? Okay, we're talking about a top-notch customer care. We're talking about a payment platform. We're talking about the last mile delivery and logistics uh, network. So at the business, you can just focus on your core business and leave everything else to this, this platform. So to me, this is gonna be the next big thing in the region. And of course, uh, the, the key notion for this platform is to see these as small businesses as partners, as, as strategic partners. And I think this is something that Cherim is pretty much proud of. I mean, we have been always looking at uh, different stakeholders within our business model, customers, captains, and, and other merchants and third party as partners. 
and they did again witnessed by our recent move into uh, a zero percentage uh, by our new uh, business uh, food, uh, food model. So I think it's key for the platform to understand these, these businesses and their partners. Okay, I mean, I, I have to appreciate the technological irony of uh, speaking about outsourcing and the sharing economy and the players in that economy, outsourcing them to the platforms. I mean, it's an interesting thing to see. So you went into the future with the prediction. Let's stay there. Uh, Kareem 2021 plus. Uh, what are the other things that we're going to see outside of what you've mentioned already at the beginning? I know, for example, that if I pull up uh, um, uh, a bolt, uh, that's, uh, that's also ride hailing, that's over here in Europe from Estonia, uh, they also have food, but they also have micro mobility. So all the scooters uh, are scooters or maybe groceries, things that Cream would be looking to expand into? Uh, looking at Karim's plan for the, for the next one or two years, of course, our primary objective is to uh, become the region's most trusted super app, right? A super app that is in the hands of people on a day-to-day -day basis. For that to happen, of course, we need to cater to a number of different service categories. Uh, mobility of people is our core business. I started with ride hailing, uh, you mentioned uh, personal mobility. We already have Karim Bike in a couple of uh, cities across uh, the region. And uh, very soon we're going to get into more personal kind of mobility options. Uh, we also think about getting into intermodality solutions, right? The intermodal solutions are those solutions that provide a, let's say, end to end service. Imagine you want to go from A to B, and that requires a number of different modes of transportation. You want to walk for 10 minutes, then you're going to start cycling for another 20 minutes to get into a bus stop, and then you're going to take a ride by a bus, and that could be actually a public transportation uh, bus. And then at the destination, you probably take Kareem for the last mile to get into your destination, right? So that's sort of a kind of full-fledged end-to-end intermodality integration in mobility of people is something that we're working on. Food delivery is something that uh, we uh, want to, let's say, uh, double down on in terms of our offering, in terms of our selection. Of course, the new uh, food model on the basis of uh, zero percentage commission uh, is something that we pretty much uh, uh, hopeful about. Uh, we're working on the next service category, and again, I'm going to announce it here. It hasn't yet been announced publicly, but we're working on our grocery service, right? We believe uh, grocery is one of the most frequent, uh, let's say, services of people in this region, not only this region, actually across, across the globe. And there is a lot of room for improvement in terms of customer experience, online experience of, of of people, so very soon you're gonna have grocery services uh, on our super app. Uh, apart from that, I think uh, Karim Pay is gonna be a big thing in 2021 and beyond. Uh, over half of the population in this region are either unbanked or underbanked, right? The same kind of analogy that we use for some people going from no phone to a smartphone there are also a potential for people, there's a potential for people to go from no bank to a pure online financial services provider. And Karim Pay can be that trusted financial services provider. So that's something that we have in mind. Very soon you're gonna experience open loop P2P. That's gonna allow you to do instant P2P, peer-to-peer -peer money transfer between Karim users and instantly you can actually go to an ATM and cash it out. So it's gonna be an open loop. You're gonna have a variety of bill payment and prepaid and postpaid mobile recharge. And inshallah, we're also working with the regulator to realize the licensing requirement to get into the cross-border remittance. That's a super big opportunity in this, uh, in this region. You may or may not know, but we're actually sitting on the biggest global corridor of cross-border remittance happening between GCC and Southeast Asia. And this is a great opportunity to actually improve people's life in that, in that respect. So Karim Pay is going to be big. And of course, apart from that, 
over the course of 2021 and beyond, you are starting to uh, see a lot of more third party service providers are tenants on our super. It's becoming even more exciting. Um, it's, it's really interesting to to hear about the the fintech approach essentially like uh, it, because that makes you a partially a fintech company when you mention payments not just like i do in the store with the watch but between each other i know for example that apple pay is also supposed to let you transfer money between uh, users but it's not available around here so i'm also still waiting for some solution that's like you know venmo or or cash app and actually uh i was thinking about your biggest competitor about your biggest competitor that perhaps doesn't really even care about the platform, uh, voice. Because if I, hey Siri or OK Google, my device, and ask for those services, and knowing that both of those platforms are looking to sort of connecting more and more things. Initially with Siri, we had just Apple Music. Now they allowed Spotify. So it's not unreasonable to assume that just like Google, everybody will be developing and also onboarding more of those integrations. So do you think that perhaps once Kareem could be just, hey, order me a car or, hey, I would like to eat Italian food and the voice uh, basically doesn't even allow you to get into the app because it's just that interface? Again, allow me not to uh, reveal any further details on that, but I can only tell you that uh, there are pretty interesting stuff around what you just mentioned is happening in our r and uh, uh, kind of uh, department, right? So uh, our product teams are actually working and ideating ideas around this. Uh, but let me uh, let me uh, let me stop here. I think uh, very soon uh, you're gonna hear uh, some good news on that. Hopefully, hopefully you heard it here first. Uh, okay, so um, I have just some closing questions from my side before we jump into the audience questions. Uh, your decision-making framework. It doesn't have to be specific. It can be specific, but generally like a rule of thumb, what kind of criteria does a decision that's important for you, for Kareem, has to meet in order to be recognized as a positive decision that you're going to execute? Good question. Uh, never really uh, thought about it. Uh, let, me, let me share with you the kind of uh, thinking process that I myself and my team goes through when it comes to uh, solving an, a strategic problem. And maybe that gonna answer your question. So we typically, once we, uh, let's say we either pick up or we observe or we come up with, let's say a strategic opportunity or, or problem. And then we are asked to really looking at it and crack it and then come up with some strategic recommendation. And we typically, uh, once we take a problem or opportunity, we start framing some high level guiding principle. So what are those key objectives that we wanna get out of this? What are those, let's say, boundary conditions? What is that we try to optimize, right? We first try to answer that. We create some sort of a kind of guiding principle for ourselves. That's gonna guide the overall decision making and the overall kind of framing of the problem. Then we have started to uh, break down the, the problem or the opportunity in, 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 in the smaller pieces. And then we have started to study each of those things and I started to crack them. We typically either take an outside in, uh, which is like a market-based view, or an inside out, which is like a resource-based view towards a strategy. So in some cases, you primarily looking at your existing capability and closeness to your core when it comes to cracking a problem. In some cases, you actually look at, look at the market opportunity without respect to your internal kind of capability at that point in time. In some cases, the mix of both, right? Depending on the view, depending on this perspective, then we have started to collect data. We have started to do benchmarking. We have started to do landscaping of the region and, and that particular study. We have started to talk to different experts. And then accordingly, we started to come up with a number of key dimensions or a number of, let's say, key criteria that are important for that particular uh, kind of decision. Like if a decision is about entering a new market, it's, it's about the size of that market. It's about the competitive intensity in that market. It's about your ability to execute and implement your strategy. So these are, for example, three 
let's say, important criteria. Then maybe in some cases we're talking about a list of 10 to 15 different criteria. And then, and then including a mix of quantitative and qualitative approaches, we have started to gather data about each of those dimensions across different options. And then accordingly, we start to compare them and come up with recommendations. Okay, I mean, that sounds a little bit like a mix between uh, OKRs, objectives, and key results, uh, and Toyota's Kaizen method of following everything broken down into the smaller you steps. Can say, you can say so. And my last question is a warm and fuzzy one looking to the future. If you could cast a spell that would allow and provide education of a specific topic, of a specific area to all the 12 year olds around the world, what would it be? What do you think is a skill or any piece of knowledge that if all the 12 year olds had, it would be a better place? Uh... There's a lot to choose from, I know. Yeah, yeah, let me, uh... how many options do I have? <laughs> you can choose one, you could choose 10. Just let me know, of course, for example, teaching about the basics of personal finance is, uh, is an obvious one, but uh, perhaps you have something different. I would go, uh, my first pick is going to be uh, kind of basic programming logic and kind of algorithmic thinking. I think uh, that's a must have uh, to live uh, a happy life uh, uh, in these days. Uh, the second thing I can think about is structured problem solving. I think uh, the next generation more and more are going to be great problem solvers. Otherwise, they cannot survive or, or, happy, uh, or have a happy life. So a structured problem solving is the next. Uh, communication skills, again, uh, the youth, the new generation is used to uh, see themselves behind these apps and these social uh, platforms, and then they're going to portray themselves the way they would like to. Uh, but I would say they definitely need to double down on the kind of social interaction and communication skills. And last but not least, I think the art of uh, living a happy life is something that uh, I would at least uh, try to teach my uh, 12 years old uh, uh, son. I don't have any son. I mean, imagine if I would have a son in the future. Okay. Okay, I, uh, I I completely agree with your choices. Um, so on to the questions that we have from the audience. Uh, actually, we have someone uh, positively recognizing what you just said about uh, educating the 12 year olds. So that was definitely a good choice, looks like it. Uh, Chris asks, what new markets is Scream looking into for expansion? South America, anywhere else? Can you speak to that at all? Uh, I can share some insight, Chris. Thanks a lot uh, for your question. Uh, I think this has been our conscious choice to focus on the region. And I'm talking about the region, I'm talking about the Middle East, North Africa, and, and Pakistan in principle. Uh, I think we believe there is still a lot of room to improve people's lives in this region. And uh, while other players and other big companies are focusing on different parts of the world, I think we see that as our purpose, as our mission, to make sure that in the first place, we improve and simplify the lives of people in this region. So our focus is going to be in the region, but it's not going to be limited to cities and areas where it is relatively easy to do this. Again, Dubai is probably an easy place to set up a business and, and conduct business, right? But we not necessarily limit ourselves to that. We consciously go to remote areas and to other cities where there are challenges and people are actually struggling on their daily life. There is a lot of friction. There is a lot of kind of open loop, kind of uh, breaking experiences, broken experiences. I can give you an example. I mean, Musel. Musel is a city in Iraq. Not necessarily the easiest place to start a business and operate. We decided to launch our operation in Musa very recently. So I would say for the next at least two years, the focus is going to be uh, remaining on Middle East. God knows, I mean, beyond 2022, we may decide to uh, expand uh, geographically. And when it comes to expansion, of course, uh, LATAM seems to be 
one of the relevant geographies in terms of the similarities, cultural similarities, geographic similarities, market similarities. So could be an option, but honestly, uh, there haven't been any decision on that uh, so far. Chris, I hope that answers your question. Uh, next one comes from Andreas. And Andreas asks about, we're in the B2C, what about B2B? Uber has Uber Freight and potentially other services that aren't exactly for me walking on the street, just rather me having a business need. So the question here is, is Kareem going to follow suit or anything similar? Indeed. Uh, Andres, uh, thanks a lot for your question. Uh, spot on. Uh, correct. I mean, Kareem has already started we started from kind of B2B business, like in the beginning, right? So we used to be a kind of corporate car dispatcher. And then from kind of B2B model, we gradually moved into a B2C model. And out of now, even we still have our B2B kind of ride hailing service. But if we put ride hailing aside, uh, I would say uh, since a couple of years ago, we started to uh, initiate and launch a number of B2B services. Charim Express, you may or may not have heard about it. It's, it's a last mile delivery service that actually provides delivery uh, offering to any business in the region, either big or small. That's a kind of B2B kind of business and growing pretty fast. Uh, we also thinking about uh, our kind of B2B payment solutions, right? Not only providing payment options to customers, but also providing payment options to merchants. That's something in the pipeline and hopefully in the near future, in one way or the other, we would have that opportunity. And there are also other B2B areas like the supply side of business that we're thinking about. But in just, let's say, recap my, my answer, yes, B2B is definitely within uh, the spectrum of, of Kareem focus. B2B, B2C and B2B2C is still going to be the main focus. But in the near future, you're going to see more and more B2B offer. Okay. So, Andres, hope that answered your question. Uh, we've got one from Atib. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Excuse me if I'm saying it wrong. Uh, this seems like a challenging one. In recent times, we've seen Facebook and other big platforms under fire for overpowering, exploiting smaller players in the marketplace, which I have to add is sort of a natural course of evolution whenever somebody becomes a major player in any industry. And the question here sheds the spotlight on Kareem. Since Kareem is on a similar route of becoming super big, what is Kareem's understanding or policy on the matter? Atib, uh, challenging one. Uh, I would proudly say that uh, looking at again, and I'm talking on behalf of Kareem, someone knowing the inner working of the company and someone being exposed to a lot of internal conversation. You look at the Kareem mentor, you look at the Kareem motto, the purpose, the policy, uh, if everything is around doing good and being good. Uh, and I can proudly say that the company has always been looking at the surrounding environment and the players within it as, as partners. From day one, we started to uh, have that kind of lens toward our captains. Uh, and, and the same goes for other players, our super app tenants, our partners, our merchants. So, uh, again, maybe it sounds a bit floppy or you may like, oh, yeah, this is like a positive side of the story. But in principle, I can uh, confess that the, uh, the strong conviction within the senior leadership of Kareem is that the ecosystem is going to thrive and it's going to sustain over time if the different players within it look at themselves as partners and together start building that ecosystem. So from that perspective, of course, you guys can judge us in a couple of years and then get back to us whether that has been something only in words or you could also see that in our action. But I can, uh, I can assure you that this is the intention and we don't have any other intention uh, rather than getting into partnership and, and creating win-win situation for all players within this ecosystem. Adib, stay focused, stay tuned, and just watch Kareem and verify this answer in a couple of years, just like Fadad said. And uh, I invite everybody to ask your questions if you have any, because otherwise this is going to be the last one. And this is from our own Timek. 
How do you plan on new app services to add to the super app? What are the criteria for future implementation? Good question, uh, Timek. Uh, so uh, there are a number of different criteria, at least talking about our service portfolio expansion on the super app. There are a number of different criteria we're looking at. Uh, one of them is voice of customer, right? I mean, continuously we go into markets, existing market and new market and start talking to people, whether it's a kind of quantitative survey, whether it's a kind of quantitative focus group discussion, whether it's a kind of Delphi method. Uh, we have started to look at people's life, where they spend their most of their time, what are the key challenges and pain points in their life. So that's one key input into this decision making. Another input is, is where people spend most of their time in terms of activities or in terms of daily activities. What are the most frequent kind of activities that you as a customer or potential customer engage in, right? The third one is, is synergy. Right, we're looking at how much synergy a new service offering can create with existing services on our super app. The fourth one is our ability to provide a best-in-class service in a timely manner. We should be able to build a service or get into a partnership and introduce it to the market with highest level of quality and reliability. We question ourselves, are we in the position to get there in a timely manner or not? We're not yet ready uh, for that. And then again, last but not least, we're also going to look at the uh, regulatory environment, the contextual factor that may hinder or accelerate the, uh, let's say, introduction of a new service. We put all these things together. At the same token, we also look at the size of the market, obviously. We look at the competitive intensity in that particular market. We look at the experience that existing players offer customers in that market. We put all these things together, and this is one of those kind of multi-criteria decision-making framework that uh, Philip was uh, referring to. And at the end, we come up with, let's say, the next wave of services uh, on our super app. But one thing that we always... Uh, uh, let's say a stick to is that we are not into we are not into rushing to expanding our, our service portfolio at the cost of uh, let's say uh, suboptimal experience for our customers. We only gonna start adding new services on our super app when and only when we are sure about the quality of existing service. Okay. So essentially, whilst each new idea, service, whatever it can be perceived on its own, uh, always the sort of deciding factor is whether it fits in the Kareem garden and whether it helps all the other flowers grow or whether it stops them from doing so, more or less. So I yeah. hope we answered your question. Uh, and for that, uh, seems that there are no further questions and we are hitting the fifth. Oh, okay, there is another question. Chris again, has Kareem explored short-term use for private cars, at cars model? Is in the IE, use the Kareem Super app to find available cars, unlock, and drive? Good question. Uh, we, uh, to be honest with you, as much as I can share details here, uh, we had that idea earlier on in 2019, of course, with the COVID hitting the market and the whole uh, sharing economy going deep. Uh, that was out of the question. Uh, it is still one of the, uh, let's say, ideas on the table. I was talking about providing an end-to-end -end mobility of people kind of service, right? So we want to be, and I can I can claim that we are already that kind of player to get a bit Uber, but we want to remain that particular player that every time you're thinking about going from A to B, Kareem is the name coming, coming up to your mind. I mean, imagine you're thinking about a search, the first thing, internet search, the first thing, coming to your mind is, is probably Google, right? You're thinking about e-commerce, you know the name. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, in order to, let's say, own the end-to-end -end mobility of people, then getting into, let's say, private car sharing model is also one of the things that we should definitely think about. So, but if you ask me in the order of sequence, is it gonna be, let's say, a high priority offering over the next couple of quarters? Maybe not. Chris, I'm sure that. And of course, at the end of the day, we do care a lot about our captain. 
So from that perspective, our first priority is to ensure that we increase their earning and provide more working opportunities for them. Of course, the next level would be to engage, a, let's say, a personal car and private car into our fleet. Chris, I hope that answers your question. It sure did for me. So for that, like I was saying just before this question appeared, we're hitting the 55th minute mark. I really enjoyed this. So thank you so much for this. It was a very meaningful conversation. Philippe, uh, thank you so much uh, for having me uh, here with you and your guests uh, and your audience. Uh, I hope uh, I managed to uh, uh, feel like an hour of uh, good conversation uh, with your audience. Uh, um, I hope uh, they like it and then uh, more than happy to get any questions or any comments or feedback uh, afterwards. Thank you so much for having me here. Absolutely. Uh, we were honored. So, dear audience, uh, this is over for today. But as every Tuesday, we will be seeing you next week. And keep your eyes peeled because the Disruption brand has much more things coming than just Disruption Talks in the upcoming weeks. So thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, dear audience. And see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good day.